I guess we forgot to give the disclaimer at the beginning that, like, we obviously can respect people's opinions just because they don't like our favorite books. That's fine. I don't like a lot of people's favorite books, and it's fine. You um, should put, like, a warning screen at the beginning that just says exactly that. Just, like, warning. We respect everyone's opinion. This is not a definitive... Yeah, like, you're allowed to This is to not have... an objective point of view. Yeah, you're absolutely allowed to have your own opinion about any of these books, um, and I'm not at all offended by it. I think what we sought out to do here was pick out reviews that were just like, really, if you're gonna hate a book, like, this is your criticism of it. Well, you What's up, everybody? Welcome to a new video, or welcome back if you've been here before. Thank you guys so much for just clicking on this video, and thank you for the support we've gotten so far. If this is something you enjoyed, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell to know when we post a new video. Uh, we're aiming to do three or four a week, and so far we're on week three, mm -hmm. and we've accomplished that so far. So if you'd like to stick around, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. So today, we're going to be reacting to one-star reviews of our favorite books. Of some of our favorite books. Uh, yes, that's a good point. Of some of our favorite books. And I really wasn't going to use Stay Gold for this, um, but the reviews were just too good. Like, the bad reviews were just too good to not use it. Um, so I decided to do Stay Gold. So I apologize for that, but it's worth it. Alright, Casey is going to kick us off. Well, we're going to start with one of my favorite books of this year called Oathbringer, and we are going to read a few of the one-star reviews from there. Let's see. Boring. Boring. Um, it's a one, one-word review. Um, yeah, I mean, it's 1,300 pages long. Um, I, I would suspect that some people will get pretty bored with, with reading um, a 1,300-page book. My question, but my question to that would be like, are the first two boring then also? Because like... Yeah, because this is the third book. You made it this far, so I don't know. That doesn't make a lot of sense. I just like that it's one word, just boring. Boring. Yeah, okay, let's see what this person says. Boring. Guess I should have started with book one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> reading tip number one. Start with the first book in the series. But could not get into the names, the locations, too in-depth to follow. Yeah. Fantasy. Um, you're missing about 2,600 pages of, uh, <laughs> of <Content>. story. <laughs> um, if you were to start uh, the Stormlight series with book three, yeah, I would, I would say that you probably wouldn't know what's happening. Um, and yeah, that would... I could see that being boring, and, and yes, there are a lot of names that, if you were to read book one, would it and book two would explain what who those people are and and the locations and the world. Um, well, and just like recognition, like like, like, but like you start to would... recognize words in fantasy. Like a lot of times when we read fantasy books, the first like fifty pages, we're yeah. like, who the f are these people? Right. But the more you see them, the more yeah like, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're missing out on, like, whole, like, relationships being formed, too. Like, yeah, book three is not like, the place. Family, friendship, like, romantic relationships, you have no, yeah. It's not the place, like, I mean, who, do you guys do, the, does anybody do that? Where you just start in the middle of, a, like, an actual series? You no, just nobody does that. This person does that. And the audacity to write a one-star review based off your, your accident or your shortcoming. I don't know if it's an accident. I just like that it says, guess I should have started with book one. Oathbringer yeah, so. is my favorite, and I and I pretty much finished the fourth one, and so this is my favorite out of the whole series. But I can guarantee you that if you were to start the series on this one, yeah, you wouldn't know what the hell's going on. That's true. Okay. Okay. And here's the last one for Oathbringer. So bad. Drags on and on and on and on and on. And on and on and on and on. Hard to believe that this is the same man who wrote The Writ Mattists and Way of Kings. Boring. Was torture to finish. This book could have been one bout 450 pages instead of the 1300 and it would have lost nothing. One bout 450. One bout 450. You're the mathematician here. What does that mean? One bout 450. One bout 450. That's what it says, one bout 450. Oh. One bout 450. Instead, we were treated to page after page of dragged on scenes with terrible pacing. But they said this is the same person that wrote Way of Kings. I feel like if you liked Way of Kings, this doesn't stray too far from the same equation. Well, yeah, I mean, it's in the series. Of the yeah, movie. so he's like, it's hard, this person's like, oh, it's hard to believe that well, it's the same person. 
the, the, I think what I've noticed in a lot of the one star reviews as I was going through this to pick out ones for this particular um, video is I think a lot of people liked the fact that there was more uh, action scenes kind of built into mm -hmm. the first two that the third one is really much more of character like involves much more character development mm -hmm. and a lot more of character background and i and i can see why that might be boring to people who really enjoyed the action scenes because the first two books do a really good job of like swinging between genre mm. uh genre bending genre bending genre bending yeah um and and going in between like having kind of slower more character driven parts to then more action based parts and and he separates that really really well because I don't like to action of books like I get mm. bored with that yeah so I could see if somebody's wanting and that's what they enjoyed from the last two and that's what they wanted from this like you're kind of looking at a development book um mm. and it kind of fits in that third slot really well yeah but like this is a 10 book series um it's gonna be a 10 book series yeah yeah so he's gonna he's gonna the fifth one's gonna fill up, I think finish the arc of what? these and then he's writing five more how does someone's brain come up with a 10 book series that each book is like 1500 pages according to these people it's just padding Ooh. so bad drags on and on and on and on and on and on okay and on. is that it for the fire yeah okay all right so the first book that i'm gonna start with is called carry on by rainbow Rowell. Ro Ro i'm probably butchering that row well Rowell. Rowell. Ro Looks like it says Rowell. Yeah, so um, none of these have any spoilers in them. Um, something that's not a spoiler about this book is that it's kind of a spinoff of a book called Fangirl, which I didn't read, and you don't need to read. Um, basically, in Fangirl, this girl writes fan fiction about these characters in this world, and this book takes place in that fan fiction as if it was the world. Um, so the first one I have here says, I would like to sue Rainbow Rowell for false advertising. Sorry, I forgot all dramatic. I went into this expecting a playful subversion of popular oh tropes. Unfortunately, Carry On was a disappointment and ultimately did the opposite of what it was trying in to bold. do. In bold. Yes, in bold. <laughs> that subversion of tropes, don't count on it. This book is just another magical story and is so dreadfully similar to Harry Potter that it's almost plagiarism. Okay, listen up. Just because Harry Potter is about a magical school and spells doesn't matter doesn't mean that every book written after that about magical schools and spells is a ripoff of Harry Potter. Read something else other than Harry Potter. Stop. Like, yeah, it's a book with similar aspects, but it's not Harry Potter. Literally, oh my god, sorry, I get so angry about this because I'm not a Harry Potter fan. I did not I read the first book, I didn't like it. I know come for me, I don't care. I it was I didn't like it. And for me, this filled that void. It was a magical school with spells, and I loved it. I got the same or a similar experience from that. So I get a little bit agitated when everything gets referred back to Harry Potter, because Harry Potter is not the center of the universe. You okay? Yeah. Um, this review goes on into spoiler um, territory that I'm not going to get into, but I think the point has been made. It is not a ripoff of Harry Potter. I also think that people use like the word subversion and tropes and they don't actually know what those things mean. Like I sure should don't. They just hear it. <laughs> like they hear subversion and tropes and they're like cuz you could say that in almost any generic way, subversion and tropes. Like the author was really trying to be subversive with the tropes that they use. I don't even know these you know words I mean? that you speak, but okay. Th this person is just saying that the the author relies on common tropes. Yeah, character yeah, common Literally, characterizations. Literally, what author doesn't, doesn't subvert them? I guess is what they were saying. But yeah, I don't know. I just hate when people use those words. They're they're like they're like literature course one hundred and one words too, yeah. and it's like you just say that like the t it's like it's like padding an essay. Yeah. If you if you have to discuss in class something within a book, then you'll you'll like a student who's not paying attention will be like, I really just didn't like. Yeah. That they didn't like try yeah, to subvert yeah, those it's tropes. Like that. Yeah, yeah. And it's and you're like, okay, well, <laughs> what does that mean? All right, so to carry on, <laughs> see what I did there. Um, so a common theme here is that they, everybody's like, oh, this is just Harry Potter ripoff. I'm like, oh my God. Um, but so here we go with this one. This book is an absolute mess and probably one of the most ridiculous things I've ever read. Here we get an underlined version of some of the reasons why they disliked carry on. But this is going to spin off into spoiler territory, which I won't um, get in. That won't be part of this. Um, but it says, this was literally Harry Potter. And I honestly don't understand how Rowell wasn't allowed, 
was allowed to publish it and make money off of a book that is so heavily based on Rowling's ideas. Literally, she is not the creator of all things. This literally drives me insane. I already said it. Just because a school, like, just because there's a magical school and magical abilities doesn't mean it's Harry Potter. Like, other people can write that same thing. If you take a thriller and uh, somebody dies in it and um, it happens to be their, like, ex-boyfriend, yeah, we see that written over and over and over again, but the first person to write that literally doesn't own the rights to the trope. Well, I mean, she, I mean, if you're gonna go down that line, I mean, most of the spells that she has and, like, words and things that she made up come from either, like, um, fascist rule of Europe from the 40s, um, old, like, Gaelic, and, um, Old English, and then Latin. So, yeah, like, that's pretty common in most fantasy books. I mean, even The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien created an entire language based off of Old English just because he really, really liked Beowulf. Um, so, I guess she's just like him, then. I guess. Um, this person also says, All the characters were incredibly generic and so boring. I didn't feel connected to any of them, and I couldn't I couldn't have cared less about them. Okay, I can respect... Yeah, because, like, well, you and I have had this conversation. I don't... I, I tend to rate most things, if I like mm -hmm. them, a five. Yeah. If occasionally I might, might rate them a four. I think even, like, my most hated books, I think I've rated, like, a two. But most of the time, if I rate something that's, like, underneath a four, it's the, the sh it's actually, like, something that the grammatical errors or the, the performative use of things is, like, really exploitative. That's when I, t I don't, but, like, just because I don't necessarily like something doesn't right. mean it's bad. Yeah, and, and so that's going to be our point here is, like, just because we don't like it doesn't mean that you can't by any means. And if you feel that way, maybe this isn't the video for you because we're just like trying to make it kind of funny. So, so yeah, I can respect that the characters are generic. You didn't connect to them. Like, that's fine. That's an acceptable reason. But like maybe like a one star. I think I just struggle to understand one star reviews in general. Although I've given two, two one star reviews in my life, um, which we'll talk about in another video that we're planning. But um, I've only given two. Like, I reserve those as much as I reserve my five-star reviews. Um, but it says, The spells were ridiculous, and I just couldn't take the characters seriously when they were using them. Some of my favorite were Have a Break, Have a Kit Kat, or Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? And I, when, when I say this, like, it makes me want to giggle about, like, how terrible that sounds. But if you read the book, like, it's just part of the humor and, like, part of her, like, twist on things and just, like... She's, she's, not, try she's not trying to be serious in the book. Like, she's not trying to, like write like some physics statement about how some spell should be written it's literally supposed to be like comedy but if you didn't find it funny i can respect that so my next pick is for stephen king's the stand some of the, um review available on request by those on my friends i know list. That's, i thought that was i want to know what what's in that <laughs> yeah. like is how it, do i get on your friends list is it offensive or do you like you have king fans that harass you if you were to say Ooh. something bad do they like come at you like, yeah but like grow a backbone i'm just curious what that means like are they paid for do you have to like pay to be to get this review I'm only just reviews oh my god only reviews only reviews like i'm just wondering <laughs> like what does that mean i'm not curious enough to ask you for it i just want to know what that means like do you do this on all of your reviews i don't know that's, that's good. fine that's cool all right um, but like one star and then that's what you have to say well i mean but what's in the review I don't know. They're like, I only want the people, I only want people to know that I hated this if, like, you're special to me, but, like, I want everyone to know that I hated it. You just don't get to know why I hated it. I just feel like unless you're like a part paywall. of my only reviews. A paywall. There has to be a paywall there. Anyways, all right. Uh, let it be known. Hmm. I hate Stephen King's writing. Okay. I hate it. Okay. Don't ever read this book. He's okay. a predictable, superfluous, and ridiculously common writer. If this is horror, you've never read Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> He's a ridiculously what? Um, What'd you say? Common writer. Or ridiculously, common? Like, I think that's really interesting um, to call this particular book, pr like, predictable. Mainly just because, like, I didn't really read the synopsis, but, I mean, it starts off as, like, a gigantic... Like, it starts off as, like, a epidemic that kills like 99 and this isn't this is stuff that would be on the back of the book that kills like 99 percent of the population then has another section that talks about kind of like the rebuilt like the rebuilding of 
the US and then like a battle versus good and evil and all those things would be like if you do read the back of the book would be on it the way it's done I don't the ending there's no way there's no way that you guessed what the ending was gonna be like well, there's no way there's no way like it there's no way that, that was predictable. He, the person literally says that, like, Stephen King is predictable, but, like, that's precisely the reason why I cannot read Stephen King, because he's not remotely predictable, and my brain is like, what in the hell is happening here? Like, I cannot read Stephen King because he confuses yeah, me. Like, it, it, like, he goes to another dimension and takes people with him, but I, my bags are not packed and I don't get on that flight. Well, like, the first... <laughs> the I'm so confused. <laughs> the first half of the book versus the second half are, like, com two completely different stories. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, to each their own. Sure. I don't know how we get to Edgar Allan Poe, um, I guess gothic <laughs> American literature, to then Stephen King. Um, I'm sure that Stephen King was influenced by Edgar Allan Poe, um, but I don't know that I would use, like, yeah. the most basic American horror writer you know what? in existence this as, like, sounds a like, comparative... This sounds like example. I wrote a horror review. It sounds like someone who doesn't like horror wrote a horror review. Yeah, because I'm like, that's the only yeah. horror author you know? Like, there are plenty of others right now. There's a lot of really good postmodernist horror that's There's Darcy being... Coates. Okay. I know you hate her. Well, no, I don't hate her. I just don't like that she uses the word that 20 times on a page. Anyways, um, like, there are plenty of, like, I mean more modern horror authors at the moment. It's a really popular, especially within, like, like Clive Barker, you have Chesia Burke, you have um, Carmen Maria Machado, you have Nick Cutter. Well, as you Dean say Coons, that... If you want to go there, like... It occurs to me that people also just love to hate what's popular. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. I mean, there's a reason why... And I could see that, because, I mean, I have an issue with that sometimes with music. Yeah. Um, but... I don't know, I like, but going back to Edgar Allan Poe, I don't know how much more basic you can get. <laughs> if it were possible to punch a book <laughs> in the face, I would do it. Lazy, <laughs> self-indulgent, boring. Okay, you yeah. know what? I can respect that, though, because that's how I feel about my two-star, my two one-star reviews. Like, I just want to punch the book. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Like, that doesn't yeah, really... It's pretty that's funny, like though. Yeah, I like that one. This one kind of goes hand in hand with that one. DNF, just couldn't haul my ass through it, man. I feel you know, good. when you're just not in the mood for some long, heavy shit, yeah. Yeah. But Preach. that's what I like. I'm like, why I won? Start then. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I can respect just, that one. Yeah, I like no, it. Like, They're just, just like, I don't like it. it. <laughs> no, hey, you know what? I've done the same thing. I've put down. Like, I'm like that with the book Pride and Prejudice. A lot of people love that book. I don't know why. I think it's incredibly boring, and I can't haul my ass through that book either, yeah. except that I have to sometimes due to my courses. But, yeah. you know, I respect I respect the hustle on that. What was the point of this? <laughs> it just says, what was the point of this? Good review. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I would say that all, all writing is a conversation between sure. the author and the reader. The point is whatever you want to make it. There it is. All right, the next book I'm going to talk about is Vampire Academy, um, and let it be known that I have not read this book since high school, um, or the series, and I loved it in high school, and I know that things have changed since I was in high school, um, so I looked through some of the reviews to see if I could find anything that might be interesting, and I, I did. People really like to shit on this book, and that's okay. All right, so this review is really long. Um, I probably won't read the whole thing, but um, let's just talk about some of the funnies in it. I think the gist of this review is that they are like stuck in 1960 and religious type of like I don't know how to say it like um very sheltered yeah it's a very sheltered view um but it says being a middle school teacher I am constantly looking for more books to put in my classroom library. It is important to include a variety of genres in this library and I love to read just about anything. Wait is this for a middle school age group, though? No, it's for... It would be like... No, it's definitely for high school. Okay. With all of the emphasis on vampires recently, I chose to read this book by looking at other readers' reviews. Because its primary audience is YA, I thought that it may be a good fit for my library. Not... I disliked this book for these reasons. So the thing is, like, you just made a good point. Like, just because something is YA doesn't mean that it's, like, middle grade or even, like, there's definitely older YA. Like, A Court of Thorns and Roses was deemed YA for a long time until they realized that it wasn't. Um, and still a lot of people consider it YA. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's meant for 
that audience. Yeah, like a 12 year old. <laughs> so number one, it's poorly written. I disagree, but I can respect that. Like if you feel like it's poorly written, then whatever. Um, every paragraph contains at least one swear word, often the F word. Hell like, yeah. Like, oh no, like our kids can't, our kids, they're like, oh, these people are adolescents. They're almost adults. They've never heard it. I guess they've, this they've Vampire Academy is the first time they're ever hearing a swear word the, and the world is going to end. Yeah, now. the fastest way into sin. The yeah. fastest way into immorality is here in the F word. It is. Before I was halfway through the book, the 17-year-old main character, 17 years old, had her shirt off making out with a boy and her best friend had gone all the way. I have a secret for everyone. Don't tell me these things actually happen. Like, no. teenagers know what sex is. And I understand that you want to censor that, but it's probably better not to <laughs> if they learn from um, respectable adults, preferably their parents, but also sexual education within school, sex ed. Um, it would be better for them to learn it from safe people than them just going out and doing whatever the hell they want to and then getting into like yeah. something way over their heads. Yeah, I like this one too. The best friend is a cutter, end quotations, and cuts herself whenever things go wrong, which is often. Like, why don't we take a second to think about why Rochelle Mead might have put these things in this book. Obviously, these are issues that adolescents struggle with or might want support or might want to say, hey, maybe I'm not the only one who is having either um, this, this difficulty coping or is wanting to experience sex for the first time. I think it's really important that those things are written in. Now, let me say, I have not read this book since high school. Do not come for me. I, I'm not sure how good the representation is. Um, I've watched other people's opinions of it um, who kind of say, like, yeah, it helped me through things. So as long as it's helping someone... But the thing is, is like... But she doesn't want it in there at all. She right. doesn't want it mentioned. She and wants it, like, hidden like it doesn't a happen. A lot of authors who are quote-unquote respectable in the scene won't aren't able to put things like that within right. their books because they keep getting censored. And the problem right. is, is just because you pretend something doesn't, doesn't exist yeah. doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Right. Like, right. there are plenty of young women and men who self-mutilate. Mm -hmm. It is a problem. Yeah. And not having any sort of representation as to what that even is makes people feel crazy. I am from yeah. the Appalachian South. I am from Northeast Tennessee. Like these people, these kids who struggle with things like this get called demonic. Like they're, yeah. they're, they're like demon possessed. Like it's a moral issue. It's Whoa, not... that's not how we need to enter adulthood. Yeah. Like censorship is so bad. Yeah. Um, and then the next one I have here is I couldn't stand the lead female. I hated that letting vampires feed on you was addictive and gave you a high. That's not a spoiler. Um, but, this is a common trope in vampire yeah, books. Yeah, like every like, vampire that's thing. That's like literally part of like being in a vampire <laughs> book. Um, yeah, unless like unless it's like an at, like unless it's purposefully like body horror type things, like most of the time that's a thing in, in yeah. vampire stories. Oh, here we go again. I came across the f word several times. God bless. Maybe the book got better. But because of those things, I just didn't want to continue. Yeah. I really didn't hold my interest, and I didn't care. Every time someone about says anyone in the book, the f word, a piece of their soul disappears. I know into hell. It's like I have, I have very. You're looking at a demon. I mean, you're already you're already transgendered. So <sighs> I mean, I'm transgenderedism. I, I am transgenderedism. The disease that is transgenderedism is I. in that sentence it it needed to it's happen the grammar in me though the grammar it needed to happen i did it on purpose you know that, right yes i know i didn't think they i didn't think you <laughs> thought that was the correct way of saying something okay let's see okay so the haunting of hill house i want you all to understand this this book is a critique on both gender and sexuality it is essentially considered a proto um a proto piece of queer literature um this was written kind of around the time that beatnik, um, the beatniks were doing stuff, and um, you know, just a couple decades before we have the civil rights for the LGBTQ movement happening um, on a larger scale in the country. So um, keep that in mind as we go forward. This is not supposed to be a book that's scary in the sense that when you read it, you're supposed to feel fear. This is a book that was using horror tropes to comment 
on the suppression of both gender and sexuality during the 50s is when I believe this was released, actually. But, um, but I'm going to read these, these two comments in succession, um, just because I thought this was weirdly weird. I just thought this was weird. Thought I would be brave and pick this up after being scared out of my wits by the Netflix series. There is absolutely nothing scary about this book. When they say that, when they, when they say they, the novel, was inspiration for the Netflix series, I'm not sure how. Mm. As the only similarities are that there's a house and people with same names in the house. However, even without comparison, the book was boring and a letdown in my opinion. Maybe I missed something. And then here's another one. I can only say that the book is nothing compared to its Netflix version. Mm. It rarely happens in my reading life that I could find a book not only just a book not only just not better than, mm. but mm -hmm. far worse than its motion picture version. It's a series, it's not a motion picture. Unless you're talking about like the 50s version or like the really, really, really bad 90s. But they're probably not. Version. Probably not um, the book version did have some characters that have the same name as the Netflix version. And there are obviously some good quotes which have been borrowed by the TV program. But other than that, I can only say I am deeply disappointed. Is that a result of my expectation being raised so high after watching the Netflix version? Okay, I'm going to explain something. There are three levels of book to film adaptation that we talk about in critical courses. Okay, we have direct translations. So something like Harry Potter, or Lord of the Rings, those type of um, those type of series that get turned into movies, they're essentially direct. The only mm -hmm. things that get changed are um, things that wouldn't translate well uh, from a book to a movie, or maybe that they can't do due to like being kind of limited te technologically, or um, to shorten it, because if you were to try to make a movie out of one of those books, I mean, it, it would be, it would you, you would have like nine hours right. of film time, okay? You have another, you have an adaptation that um, isn't necessarily a direct translation, but it... Loosely based? Yes, it's loosely based. It takes the spirit of the work. Okay. So a really good example of this would be like kind of biographical films um, like Bohemian Rhapsody. I think that was the one that was called that was about Queen, right? I don't remember. Yeah, the one that was about Queen and then there was mm -hmm. another one about Elton John. Right. Those things had a lot of things that didn't actually happen in either one of the lives of these men, but they changed some of the um, events or the order of events to make them more cinematically favorable to audiences. Right. And then you have the type of adaptation that is pulling inspiration from the primary piece, so from the book, but it's nothing like the book. I have a feeling that's what The Haunting of Hill House And The Haunting is. of Hill House is not supposed to be a retelling of The Haunting of Hill House. Mm -hmm. Mike Flanagan is taking elements from the book, so mental illness, um, having unreliable narrators, um, having a house that kind of represents um, this kind of soul-sucking personality changing like living being and those are the elements that he brought in to tell a completely different story he does the same thing with the haunting of Bly Manor mm. um Bly Manor is based loosely off of Henry James's work I would say that he has a little bit more of inspiration from those into his um his series than say this one right. but if you are watching the haunting of Hill House on Netflix it is not the same thing at all and it's not going to be. Right. You cannot expect to watch a TV series just because it has the same name and then for it to be exactly what right. the book presents. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, you can be inspired by something that yeah. doesn't at all come out at the end looking like the thing you're inspired by. So please, if you read this book, do not expect it to be like the Netflix series, but also don't not like don't not read it because it's not like the Netflix series. It's a wonderful critique on um and especially if you're American and you wanna see kind of the um evolution of gender and queer politics, this is a great book to look at. It it has a lot of sociological um importance within it. But please. They're not the same thing. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Let's see. 
This book is dull with unlikable characters and barley any horror. Barley any, any horror. Barley any real horror. Okay. Eleanor is insecure and paranoid. Being inside her head was annoying and exhausting. It's what we call an unreliable narrator. Um, the other cast of characters were no better, except for maybe the doctor, but that's probably because he barely spelled it right time. Uh -oh. Had a personal a personality. The horror itself is, for the most part, simply things that go bump in the night. Nothing scary at all. I mean, okay. It is a living house that you're in. <laughs> Sounds a little scary to me. Um, that, you know, you sometimes just get some real weird feelings inside of it, but that's all right. Um, there's a lot of emptiness in between that does nothing for the story, just people Miran <laughs> meandering about, having meaningless conversations, making silly jokes, and generally treading water. I do want to say, this is from Eleanor's point of view, so you're, you're getting... Um, you're getting everything just through her eyeballs. Those people might not be anything like that. Right. I, uh, I suggest that everybody tries to read with the lens that the author wants you to try to at least read through. Let's see. There's one more that I thought was funny in this one. <laughs> I feel like the author was treating me like I was stupid. <laughs> Awful dialogue and characters. Don't like this at all. The characters are childish. That's true. That's a good observation. They all are, except for, like, one of them. There's nothing scary about this book, It's and it's just rubbish. They talk rubbish the whole way through. We get it. Mrs. Dudley clears the plates away <laughs> at 10, at 10 a.m. I liked that one. It's true. You can't have... If, if you get there after 10 a.m., you can't have breakfast. Mm. And that that is specified multiple times. Well, so. and you know, because of that, the book deserves one star. Yeah. Well, I mean... They did say it was, like, trash before that. Yeah. But I just thought that the last one was good. So, I know I promised to not talk about Stay Gold again, but, um, A, that's probably an empty promise, and B, I am, I am trying, but B, I went through the reviews for it, and they were just, they were just too good not to. I have to. Um, probably my, my favorite one is this one right here that just says no. Just, mm -mm. just mm -mm. no. Nope. One star. No. Because, no. All right, so I like this one here. That's one side that says, I am using the small slice of phone juice I have out here in the wilderness to say. They must have taken this on a camping trip. Fuck this book. Fuck off. I just wanted a cute HS high school romance between a cheerleader and her cute trans boyfriend. This author can, this oh, author can lick my say fucking... That. Oh, I yeah, hate it. Not... Okay, me but like, let's talk about this. So this person's clearly upset because this wasn't like a cute little rom-com. And also the part of the romancing is not a spoiler. That's in, like, that's stated on the back of the book. So that part's not a spoiler. Uh, but I just want to say, like, also nothing in this book was promised to be, like, cutesy. Um, the experience of being trans right now in a high school, nothing about that really is cute. Um the relationship that is developed is cute yeah but it it doesn't come easy this book very much explores the idea of sexuality and really what it means to be straight and what what can encom encompass somebody who is straight and that including someone like someone who is straight can date a trans guy and that's really what the story is about and nothing about that is cute i mean it's it's a hard tough road now are there cute moments in the book absolutely but you're rating this one star because it was a hard emotional read? Like, what do you think those of us who experience it actually experience? So next we have this one star review that says, Every single thing about this story and the way it is written is toxic and damaging to young trans readers. Uh, I don't know if this person is trans or not, uh, but being someone who is trans and an adult, thinking about what I would give to young trans readers is this book. Um, now... There is a lot of one-star reviews about a triggering scene. Um, there is a scene in this book uh, that is very difficult to read. Um, it's not necessarily graphic, but it is very difficult to read. But I think young readers should still read it. We cannot censor and shelter kids from the reality. Now, do we, like, throw it in their face and not give them support through it? Absolutely not. We don't do that. Um, but th this shows the reality of what, what happens. Um, and I just think that giving a book a one-star review because it talks about hard topics um, just is not fair. And we don't do this to other books. I mean, I know that it does happen, but there are lots of hard topics in books that are rated five stars all the time. Granted, there are five-star reviews for this book, too. Uh, but I just, 
got frustrated that people were giving this book a one-star review because it's a hard read. I'm like, I'm sorry, not all queer romances that are on the market right now are going to be cutesy wootsy. It's just not the reality of life in general, and it's not the reality of a queer life either. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, again, I just want to say that if you hated these books, that's absolutely okay, and we can definitely have conversations about that, and I'm definitely not going to hate you. I think uh, that's absurd that people get actually mad when someone rates their favorite book a one star. Like, all these reviews, like, don't make us, like, mad. Like, they make us, I think, frustrated because we love the book so much, but, like, everybody can have their opinion, even if it's not an intellectual one. That's fine. Like, if you just want to write no, like, okay, that's fine. So our point was just, like, to kind of look at what other people thought about our favorite books. Yeah. Bella. So we hope you enjoyed this video. Um, leave us a comment. Don't forget to like the video if it's something you enjoyed. And hit that subscribe button. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.